Hello, uh, I'm Paul Beckwith and uh, this is Shackleton. Now, I know you're not supposed to carry cats like this and they really don't like getting their tummies rubbed, but uh, you know, this, <laughs> this guy's generally a good sport and you don't, they don't like you touching their tails either, but you know, he's such a star here that uh, you know, he's a good sport. He, uh, he'll be curling up next to me in a few, in a few hours when I, when I hit the sack. But anyway, I'm talking about uh, existential climate-related security risks, and I'm continuing off where I left um, off in the previous video, um, talking about all the risks to humanity, and I was talking about scientific reticence, which um, James Hansen's talked about quite a bit, and you know, I've, I've talked about uh, the silos in academia where people study just, uh, you know, they study the heck out of just one field, you know, one very, very narrow field, and they don't connect what their knowledge to what's happening from in other studies in other fields. And, you know, there's just not enough people that are system thinkers that are looking at the big picture, you know, trying to connect the dots, which is what I've been trying to do for, for many years. So, you know, the IPCC, you know, 1.5C report, looking at the difference between 1.5 and 2, you know, projected that warming, you know, if warming continued at the current rate of 0.2 degrees Celsius per decade, we would reach the 1.5 C mark around 2040. But, you know, the one and a half C boundary is likely to be passed in half that time around 2030. Um, and the two C boundary by 2045, due to accelerating anthropogenic emissions, decreased aerosol loading and changing ocean circulation. So, you know, even those numbers are, you know, when you're in a nonlinear situation, um, you can't make linear projections. And, you know, I would argue, I mean, we're basically just a very powerful El Nino away from 1.8 degrees um, for an entire month when we were undergoing the, the uh, strong El Nino back in 2017, start of 2018. I think for the month of February, we were 1.8 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial. And, you know, you can't shift baseline. You have to talk about the 1750 baseline. You can't go and suddenly say, you know, compare one and a half or two degrees to the 1880 to 1910 average or something like that. I mean, those numbers, those temperatures are based on, you know, compared to a baseline of pre-industrial. And pre-industrial 1750 was the temperature ch increased from 1750 to about the turn of the century, you know, 1880 to 1910 average is about 0.3 degrees. So when you include that proper baseline, we're already, you know, well over 1.5 degrees Celsius for, for a lot, for long durations during that powerful El Nino. So we're just one El Nino away, a powerful El Nino away from, 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 uh, passing those conditions. Um, so there's no time uh, to, to uh, so this creates an existential risk to civilization. You know, is one posing large, permanent, lar permanent large negative consequences to humanity, which may never be undone, either annihilating intelligent life or permanently and drastically curtailing its potential. Okay, driving us back uh, into the stone age, basically, if you like. Um, so the current path of warming is three degrees Celsius or more, even if this is if all the commitments by nations to the 2015 Paris Agreement were were um, realized, were done. But this doesn't include long term carbon cycle feedbacks, which then add, you know, would mean about five degrees of warming by by 2100. Now, most scientists say that warming of four degrees is incompatible with an organized global community. It's devastating to the majority of ecosystems, high probability of not being stable. It's beyond adaptation, according to the World Bank. Okay, but much lower levels of, war of warming um, are likely to get, cause this uh, existential risk to have it being realized. So, you know, in 2017, three degrees of warming was categorized as catastrophic. Um, you know, and so on. I mean, Joam um, Schellenhuber, who I met in Paris, um, he's a director of the Potsdam. He said that climate change is now reaching the end game. I like, I like him putting it this way. I mean, this is a good, uh, you know, chess term. You have the opening, the middle game, the end game. So climate is now reaching the end game. 
where very soon humanity must choose between taking unprecedented action or accepting that it has been left too late to bear the consequences. You know, and again, this, uh, you know, sort of, it's, I would argue that, you know, we, we, we're not too, by doing nothing, we're choosing to, um, you know, uh, take the latter path. We're just, you know, see what happens. And, you know, we know it's going to be an awful situation. So there's a huge risk that it, what's happening will just end our civilization. He thinks the human species will survive somehow. I probably agree with that. But we will destroy almost everything we've built up over the last 2,000 years. Think of all our cities on coastlines and how they'll just be underwater. Um, you know, all our infrastructure is being hammered. So here, here's a couple things about risk management. If this is a... Okay, so climate sensitivity, we think it's between a doubling of CO2 will lead between 1.5 and 4.5 degrees Celsius of warming you know, with most likely three. So we've got a distribution curve like this. Now the long tail here, the long fat tail, is it could be, the system could be much, much more sensitive, you know, and because everything is seems to be working, panning out to being much worse than expected, I would say that, you know, this is becoming more and more likely uh, situation. So if you've got a curve like this on the likelihood, the impacts to society are like this. And we, you know, a four degree increase to, is already, um, you know, would probably end organized society even way down here. But look at what's possible with these increases. So this is the impact. And you, there, notice there's no vertical scale on here, um, here especially. If you multiply these two together, then you get a curve something like this. It depends on the height. Um, you know, and so on. If these are normalized to, and you're multiplying, then you can get something like this. But, you know, this curve here, how high is this? This is probably way up, you know, at my ceiling, way off the screen. Um, but if you multiply this, if these are equal height, you'd get a curve like this. And the risk is, the risk is, um, you know, goes up huge amounts. But if civilization is, can't deal with this, then what's going to happen when we're up at these levels? I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. You know, but we, we have all these tipping points, critical thresholds in the system um, that, you know, make it even more, that, that maintain the non-linearity. And uh, there was a paper on the hot house earth scenario recently where we get the earth system goes to, you know, climate goes to point of no return. Now, this is assuming um, that we, you know, we're, we have no intelligence to deploy um, carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation management, you know, after we declare a climate emergency and try to arrest, uh, you know, what's happening with the destabilization of our planet. So the consequences are so severe, perhaps the end of human global civilization as we know it, even for an honest, truth-seeking, and well-intentioned investigator, it's difficult to think and act rationally in regard to existential risk. See, the problem is, is when the, the consequences are the ending of human civilization, and you multiply that by the probabilities, um, you know, even if the probability is very low, you know, you, you're, it behooves you to act and do everything you possibly can. So, you know, many scientists are self-censoring. They don't talk about these pleasant outcomes. You know, it's depressing. Uh, you don't talk about it. You know, it's not going to go away by not talking about it. You know, people say it's going to demotivate people. Well, if the world doesn't understand the path that we're on, then uh, how can you motivate people to take the action necessary to avoid what's coming on? You know, we're barreling over a cliff at top speed. And, uh, you know, we, many people don't even realize that we're, we're over the cliff. They think we're, there's still decades and decades before we have any chance of reaching the cliff. So, you know, we call these fat tail outcomes. The, the probabilities are far higher than is generally understood. So one of the ways is to look at the scenarios in, instead of, you know, because we don't have a good handle on those risks. So here's a scenario. So they look at a scenario of the near-term future, um, the 2050 scenario. So, you know, here's some of the features of it, and I highly recommend that you just Google Google the title, you know, Existential Climate-Related Security Risk, and, you know, look at this paper yourself. But the scenarios are policymakers politely don't do anything, don't declare climate emergencies, or they declare it and they cheapen the word climate emergency 
So they end up not doing anything. So carbon levels continue to go way up, but are, you know, and warming continues to go way up. And then, um, you know, then we get these feedbacks kicking in. You know, we get, uh, you know, we we get all of these, uh, you know, feedbacks kicking in, and we exceed these temperatures by 2050, three and a half, four degrees, bare minimum. You know, and then there's all of these uh, things happening. We know we have, you know, we're likely to pass this sea ice free um, September, you know, in the Arctic, you know, within within a few short years, you know, and then the duration gets longer and longer. So there's no ice all summer. And then I really think and have shown in, in previous um, videos, you know, how I would expect sea ice from our sea ice free Arctic Arctic year year round, not just in the summer. You know, and then the warming in the Arctic greatly accelerates. Um, so, you know, we get a collapse of the Amazon rainforest. We get the Greenland ice sheet starts collapsing, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, sea level rockets up. There's heat waves, uh, you know, and we exceed the wet bulb temperatures in the equatorial regions. We have to have more than a million people migrating away from the equator. You know, the jet stream's completely haywire. We have uh, monsoons, you know, all, you know, dominating um, rainfall patterns, um, you know, we get crop failures and so on and so forth. Like it's just a, a litany of collapse, collapse, building upon collapse, building upon collapse. Water availability decreases sharply in the most affected regions at lower latitudes, dry tropics and subtropics affects about, affects about 2 billion people worldwide. Agriculture becomes non-viable in the um, dry subtropics and, and so on. There's enormous uh, security implications. There's enormous migration. There's you know, more than a billion people need to be located um, and so on. You know, massive nonlinear events in the global environment give rise to massive nonlinear societal events where just nations are overwhelmed. You know, I think I think we're you know we're we're under, we're seeing this starting to happen already. Let alone 2050. I mean, um, we get armed conflict between nations over resources. Nuclear war is possible. Basically, it's outright chaos. So climate change provokes a permanent shift in the relationship of humankind to nature. Okay, so this is where we're looking at, and they recommend some policy things. I mean, we have to could treat this as a threat to all of humanity. Um, the sooner we do this, the better, the, the better our chances. There's no guarantee, but we don't have any other choice. So we've got to throw away this policy stuff that is completely ineffectual and throw away the idea that we, you know, things are changing in a linear fashion, that we have any time you know the the idea of ten years time ten years time is absurd. I mean we, we're 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 facing the wall right now. Um, you know we should have started doing something ten years ago. We don't have ten years. You know the thing we get it's the chance of success. You know if we don't take strong action now, um, every day that we every day now that we have that we lose is important. Um, you know, uh, to addressing this problem. You know, there, there's no time, there's no 10 year margin um, in, my, in my view. Um, you know, we have to um, urgently look, um, you know, examine the role that the national security sector can play um, to build a zero emissions industrial system, draw down carbon to protect human civilization, to give us a fighting chance. You know, basically, we've rolled over at the moment. We're, abs we're doing absolutely nothing. Um, you know, people are starting to wake up. But until we actually, you know, look at the CO2 curve, emissions curve, until we can start bending that down, same thing with the methane, um, then, you know, we're, 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 uh, we, we're, we're ineffectual. Our, our response is ineffectual. We absolutely need to declare a climate change emergency. We actually absolutely need to start deploying carbon dioxide removal techniques, um, and we need solar radiation management. We need to ensure that the Arctic sea ice doesn't completely vanish. So thank you for, for listening to uh, this series of videos. Bye for now.